Hey, thanks for watching the Fanboy Cantina. In this video, we're going to talk about WandaVision, episodes one and two. But before we get started, please take a moment to subscribe to the Fanboy Cantina. We cover all kinds of things about Star Wars and Lego and Marvel and G.I. Joe. Join the Fanboy Cantina. We'd love to have you. All right, so WandaVision is out. And let me bring in my uh, co-host here. Hey, Mr. C, how are you doing? Hey, everybody. Good. Glad to be back. Awesome. Yes, glad to have you. And I'm looking forward to this chat where, again, we're going to be talking about WandaVision episodes one and two here. Just in terms of format and flow, what, we're, what we'll be doing here, we'll talk about WandaVision. Then we'll talk about Wanda and Vision. And then we'll talk a little bit non-spoilery impressions about the show thus far based on what we know and then i think quickly we'll dive into the spoilers all right so just in terms of format we have recorded this in advance but if you're watching the premiere we are here live in the chat so feel free to jump in dive into the comments we'd love to chat with you have i missed anything mr c i think you've covered the basis all right cool so let's dive in. Again, we're talking about WandaVision's episodes one and two, but before we get into the deeper dive, let's just talk about the WandaVision show. And I'll pull up on the screen just the screen from Disney+. Plus. Of course, WandaVision is available exclusively on Disney+. Plus. From the description, Marvel Studios presents WandaVision, a blend of classic television and the Marvel Cinematic Universe in which Monda, uh, Wanda Maximoff, as played by Elizabeth Olsen, and Vision, Paul Bettany, two superpowered beings living idealized suburban lives, begin to suspect that everything is not as it seems. The new series is directed by Matt Shackman. Jack Schaefer is head writer. And let me get rid of that banner for a moment here. Uh, the, it is starring, as we already said, Elizabeth Olsen, Paul Bettany, as, as well as Tiana Paris, Catherine Hahn, Randall Park, and Kat Dennings, the last two we have not yet seen in the show. So, uh, so that's, what we, that's what we have about the WandaVision description. It's been 18 months, if you can believe it, since the last MCU anything that we've seen. After this onslaught of... MCU movies, one or two, or, or have we even had maybe three in a year? And we haven't seen anything in, in 18 months. Uh, the last thing that we had seen was uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, and that was in July of 2019. So it's been a very long, lengthy drought with the pushing out of Black Widow, with the pushing out of the Eternals. It's been a long uh, drought. Um Thoughts about uh, WandaVision and your level of excitement about it, Mr. C? I'll describe my level of excitement as high. I noticed when you had the Disney Plus information up under the genre, all mm -hmm. the listings there, but it for sure did not list the show as a sitcom, as a situation comedy. So from having seen the trailers, that was my big question or, or one of my main questions regarding the, the show was, how are they going to achieve this sitcom layer, but then have it be a transition from something with some ominous elements of mystery uh, that would surface at some point in the show? So right there, yeah, romance, mystery, drama, sci-fi, superhero, but not sitcom. Yet right. here we are watching a sitcom where they had many elements blended from Dick Van Dyke show and Bewitched, and then when we get to the opening credits for episode two, it's directly a, a tribute to or, or taken from the opening credits of Bewitched. So mm -hmm. as people say, I didn't know I needed a, a hybrid of Dick Van Dyke and Bewitched. If this show somehow, and we know from the trailers that this isn't the case, but if somehow it only stayed with, uh, oh, here, here's just a sitcom variation on on these two characters that that would do it for me um, my entertainment my engagement level is a, such i'm just like oh my gosh this is such an interesting hybridization of classic retro tv sitcom staples 
and and these two superheroes. Yeah, what what I I agree. I agree. They they they're really making a bold statement with this series thus far. Of the things that we've seen, we kind of know what the, what Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki and the What If series are going to be about. But with WandaVision, it's the one that we know the least, right? It's just it's very it's seemingly very different, very strange um based on what we know we know. Yeah, and I'd say that ties to the premise of the show. Like, this is supposed to be, here's at least some piece of mystery with some reveal or some hints of the reveal in the trailer, whereas the others, uh, without having seen them yet, having only seen the trailers, at least they, at least the other shows aren't featuring in the trailer this this extra layer of, uh, uh, of mystery or, or reveal. No, that's right. That's right. Uh, so let's, di- let's jump into... Wanda and Vision, two, two together, combining those Wonder Twin powers together, which is the wrong universe. That brings us to Wanda, uh, Wanda and <laughs> Wanda Vision. So uh, this is more your strong suit than mine. Uh, you are the big, bigger comic book guy than me. Uh, tell us a little bit about Wanda and Vision, if you could. Sure, I could. Sure, I will. So I decided to go with what were my first first impressions of the characters. And then I actually have to go back before comics, back to TV, but not Disney Plus, of course, which is only a new innovation. Uh, but the reruns of the classic Avengers cartoons from 1966. So specifically of all those series that Marvel, the animated 1966 uh, series block went with within the Captain America show. There it is. There were some episodes then after Cap was taken out of the block of ice that featured the uh, second incarnation of the Avengers, specifically Captain America, Hawkeye, Quicksilver, and Scarlet Witch. So the first time I ever encountered the Scarlet Witch character was through local Chicago channel 44 at the time playing the reruns. And so that had to be roughly kindergarten first grade, which as we know is an era in which we first found each other as well. So then I guess, I suppose I encountered the Scarlet Witch for the first time, roughly at about the same time I encountered you. So there's that. Um, that. Now taking it back to the comics, going to, again, instead of rerun cartoons, now we're on reprint comics. So when I was first picking up comics, now we're at the fourth grade uh, period. Uh, Out of the original X-Men reprints, it was the original X-Men series issue number six that was in reprint format where both the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants were seeking out the Submariner. And then I recognized the Scarlet Witch from the cartoon, there it is, into... uh, Magneto's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. It's just that classic Jack Kirby, Stan Lee pairing, uh, synergy and and just the visuals and the the story really did a lot. So now coming into my first uh, impression with the vision was also in a reprint format, which was released roughly at that same time. And in that reprint issue, which was originally in Avengers 58, so just, and that's a classic panel there, even an Android can cry. He got all misty eyed then when they decided to accept him. And he was a very, of course, robotic Android. They referred to him as a synthesoid. Uh, mm-hmm. But so the character comparisons could be made to more recently to Lieutenant Commander Data from Trek or, or at that time, definitely some Vulcan, uh, Mr. Spock comparisons of a, a character that just doesn't show much emotion, but for on occasion slips and then the audience, the viewer can see that there is a greater range and greater degree of emotion present in the character than they typically express. So I thought they were really great characters. And then of course, as the storylines continued, similar to the movie, then Wanda and Vision became romantically involved and then eventually married. But what were your first reads or your first experiences or encounters with the characters yeah so i'm not familiar with them from the from the comic books um 
so I'm more familiar with the characters from the MCU, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And you know, I'll, I'll say that you know, with when it comes to both of the characters, both of them have had a very challenging arc. And it's been exciting, I think, to see them grow and develop over, over time. You know, the first time that we see Wanda Maximoff is with her brother. I think this is at the end of, uh, Captain America Winter Soldier, where she's, you know, playing with the box, uh, the blocks, right? And you know, starting to get to know her her powers. And then by the time that we see her last, the, the last time we saw her was in a Avengers Endgame. And she almost takes down Thanos all by herself. So we've seen this character develop, you know, have this complete arc over the course of the MCU. However, she's had a really you know, challenging uh, life and experience, right? She talks about, you know, seeing her parents die and that's kind of how she starts as a villain um, in Avengers Age of Ultron. Uh, and and then by the end, you know, she's this, uh, this huge uh, superhero uh, and among the truly strongest Avengers. And then of course with Vision, uh, you know, he's got his origins as uh, Jarvis, right? It, as a, uh, uh, in Iron Man, the first Iron Man movie, the first MCU movie, and then of course gets transformed into into the character that we know today in Age of Ultron. I know that Age of Ultron is not a favorite uh, MCU m movie for many people. I enjoyed the movie still. Uh, I still enjoy the movie. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's kind of my my uh, knowledge of the characters. It's solely from the MCU movies. Yeah, and hey, everybody's got to like or dislike, you know, that which they do. Uh, I realize the MCU version of Vision, of course, that's more fresh in the memory compared to I didn't retain the information from the comics until I went back in to, to look at them again. Uh, but right, so the influences or the, the different elements that go into comprising Vision were mm -hmm. uh, the, the Jarvis uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the some influence from Ultron, uh, some influence from Thor, and some influence from the uh, from the Infinity Stone. Uh, so then, similarly in the comics, just his his brain patterns, as they called them in the comics, were taken from the Wonder Man character, and still Ultron was his physical architect or, or constructed his body, and then in certain other. Influences, influences that they added into the character later on. They had his android body was taken from a different android character. It, it became pretty convoluted and, and layered. Uh, but just the, the, just the basic point that Vision in the comics and Vision in the movies had uh, many different factors going into who the character was. Right. I think, and, and just to give the shout out to Bruce Banner, I believe there's a little bit of Bruce. He does take credit for being a little bit of him in envision uh and and i've got props here so here's my wanda maximoff uh, uh three and three quarter inch uh, action figure poorly articulated uh figure yes uh, so five, <laughs> yeah, five five points of articulation on this one and then we've got uh the phasing uh vision uh here so the translucent vision which uh, one of my favorites um all right, so we've talked about Wanda and Vision separately uh, here. Let's talk about the, the series itself or our impressions from episodes one and two. And this is a non-spoiler uh, talk uh, segment here. So with that, let me start first uh, on the non-spoiler talk uh, a bit. I think we're going to have different takes on this show, which is good. Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure I'm liking it. I, uh, and it's really hard for me to say that because I am starving for new content. I'm starving for the MCU. It's been 18 months since Far From Home, right? And so I'm dying for getting something new and fresh in the MCU. I think Marvel is taking a gamble a little bit on the series and that you think about traditional pilots you think about traditional you know tv series the pilot episode the first episode gives you kind of the 
the explanation or the, the signals of what we're going to be consuming. And here, it's, it's really just the first act. It's not truly like a traditional pilot. It's, it, it's, you can tell that it's leading up into something, but you really don't have a good sense of where this is going to go. And similarly, in the marketing of this show with the trailers, you, know, you, you got the, the retro TV uh, elements. We, we really know very little about where this is going to truly, truly end up or how this is going to interconnect back into the MCU films. I think if they had not bundled episode one and two together, I think it would have alienated a lot of people because at least by the second episode, you get a sense of there's something more here or it's going to be going into a different area. Um, but yeah, I got kind of mixed feelings on episodes uh, one and two thus far. I am going to continue watching, obviously, but I got kind of mixed feelings. All right. So that's that's my non-spoiler uh, a bit. Um, what are your thoughts? If at the end of the day, this show happens to not be your cup of tea, then yeah. hey, that's, that's the way it goes. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm trying to be cautious of the non-spoiler segment and be right. uh, to speak within those parameters. There were uh, tiny uh, hints of pullback of, of show suspense or show something ominous and then pull back from it rather quickly uh, in episode one and episode two. So right. it's possible. It's possible that as the story arc carries forward that you might possibly find what you're hoping for in the in the later episodes and but will time will tell to, to quote Deja only time will tell uh again for me I, I'm very much looking forward to those parts or those segments however and again we know something's coming from the trailer and and the overall uh, genres as they were listed right there sci-fi right. superhero sitcom wasn't listed as a genre to to speak on that again but if somehow just these elements of blending the dick van dyke show and bewitch just the, the set design the the opening intro instead of the pratfall over the ottoman uh footrest uh that he the, just the way the characters interacted with the set was uh i was along for the ride with that now yeah definitely i hope for something deeper cuts uh some definitely would be looking for more action maybe even some battle sequence uh, in the later episodes but so far i i really i was into it i was on board i think the performances are excellent right the wanda maximoff character and the vision have uh been you know pretty consistent throughout the throughout the mcu uh, you've gotten to see Wanda kind of loosen up, uh, you know, over time and the forging of the relationship between, uh, Wanda and Vision. Um, so, but as actors, I, I, I feel like we're, we've seen a whole other dimension of Elizabeth Olsen and, and Paul Bettany just really going outside of what we are familiar with. I think the set design and the filming are just really spot on and meticulous in that in episode one, you definitely have that Dick Van Dyke type of feel. It is done from, you know, like one camera, maybe two cameras, really. And, and so they've done it exceptionally well. And then as you got into the second episode, that feels a little bit more closer to Bewitched. Um, you know, it's got those those kinds of tones and that kind of deliberate attention to 60s television. So for technical merit and the performances, I think it's brilliant. In terms of storytelling, and I felt like, okay, I get it. By I get I get the uh, the premise in episode two, um, but honestly, I, I was like looking at my phone at the beginning of episode two. It's like, okay, where are we going with this? Um, all right. So can we hop right into the spoilers then? Let's do it. Flip. All right. So if you are watching, again, we have pre-recorded this thing, but we are live in the chat. So if you're watching the premiere, please post down in the comments. Or if you're watching this later, post in the comments anyway, because we, we love to chat and we love having the conversation with you. All right. 
Yeah. All right. So now uh, with that, let's get into the spoiler uh, talk. Um, let's talk about vibes. Uh, and we've touched on this already. Uh, the the vibes, I, I, I appreciated the, the Dick Van Dyke, the Bewitched types of vibes in episodes one and two. I also had that Twilight Zone feeling, right? Because you've got the black and white, right? So you got the Rod Serling uh, uh, type of thing, uh, you know, going on, and just one's own black and white uh, television uh, vocabulary or, or memories. And when it takes those breaks, where you can see something's not right, Wanda stares off into space, or something is awry. Uh, again, I think it is a gamble in that you know you and I. We had these shows on uh, WGN, right, in Chicago, or you could watch them on MeTV, I think, maybe, or, you know, Nick at Night may resonate for some people, but that's a certain generation. That's like Generation X or later, or maybe an older millennial. If you're a younger millennial or, or, uh, or younger than that, none of these black and white beats are going to resonate for you, or I don't think they will. Um, so uh, I, 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 that, that goes back to what I was saying about some of the gambles that I feel like uh, story-wise they're taking here. I'll give you that. For someone who hadn't grown up watching either live at the time or the rerun format of your Dick Van Dykes, your Bewitched, your right. I Dream of Genie, you could expand the genre to you know include a, whichever the shows were out from that time, your, your Green Acres and your everything, where your I Love Lucy's. Your your uh, your Danny Thomas uh, stuff, uh, where you've got this classic miscommunication was like the central beat of, of the story, as right. replicated. So yes, for people who haven't had exposure to that, that's a a, a layer, a, a, a key piece missing from how someone would consume or, or process watching the the current Wanda Vision show. So with the bewitched angle, yeah, I think it's really spot on, right? Because you've got uh, two characters that have you know, essentially magical, magical types of abilities, and so they're both kind of Samantha, right? There's, there's not a Darren. There, there's you got two Samanthas uh, essentially. It's it's also funny, as far as I know, I, I haven't checked, but I don't think they've referred to Wanda as the Scarlet Witch ever. In the MCU, she's huh. always Wanda, right? Um, so perhaps this is so, you know sort of the wake awakening or the you know the the telegraphing to the to the audience that this is the transformation of the character into truly the Scarlet Witch uh, from the comics. But uh, yeah, I, I I and I oh one thing that I really liked about episode two, I love the animated beginning, uh, the intro for that oh. Bewitch thing. That was wonderful. That was beautifully done. Um, so I like that. Uh, where would you like to go next in our discussion here, uh, Mr. Well, C? I want to jump off your point from a couple of minutes ago of the Twilight Zone influence again. So as we're speaking of the classic TV sitcoms, yeah, Twilight Zone wasn't in the category of sitcom whatsoever, but it was black and white and classic TV. So mm -hmm. then when it comes to the point in the episode where they leave the house in the nighttime, as has been had been set up by the earlier, the tree was making the noise against the window, which is a very sitcomy thing. So look, look there, right there, how they bridge from oh, here's a very mundane tree branch banging on the window to cause a sitcom uh, plot point to resolve, and now they right. exit the house to see what's the noise, and and then it became very very Twilight Zone similar the the being out on the street, the way the street lights were reflected the camera angles and then what's going on by the sewer you know and, and that's you know, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't behind the mailbox it wasn't behind the garbage can like the sewer allows for uh, something to come up <laughs> that's more threatening and more unseen and so now it's uh, is it a beekeeper suit is it is it a guy with bees is it i'm sure that was there a villain with bees that i'm not thinking of straight off the right or, or what's going on and then Pair that back to the radio message. And again, listen, now they're doing the same thing from the branch to, to the outside shot. And then similarly, from the radio in the background, help me, Rhonda. 
and then Rhonda sounds kind of like Wanda. So then mm. the radio transmission changed from the song to to what this mysterious call, Wanda, who's doing this to you. So right. I, you know, as far as setup and, and setup, uh, I'm very curious which way both of those setups are going to uh, pay off or, or what will be, you know, what's next to follow. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And since we're just talking about that beekeeper, yeah, I wonder what that's about. Uh, I, I wonder what that that's about because on the back of the beekeeper, well, one, why the heck is a beekeeper coming out of a manhole cover? Right? Why is that happening? But then the the character has the uh, sword uh, symbol on the back, and I'm gonna go things a little bit out of order but uh you know when when you see that little color helicopter you see the sword emblem on the on the front of it so uh is it a a sword agent that is is this now the first appearance of sword in the mcu or formal uh, appearance of it i don't i don't know um i don't know what that's about i also wondered because we saw again on that uh disney plus screen that randall park is, is in this randall park is uh the fbi agent plays the fbi agent in um ant-man and the wasp so is there some kind of b character in ant-man and the in the ant-man universe that I, I i don't know as you said I, I don't know what that's about um Let's two things you picked up yeah, that I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't catch the sword symbol on the red helicopter. Why was the red helicopter oh. red? Everything else was in black and white, and I so I didn't make the connections, connect the dots on the sword symbol. Uh, and but as you were saying that, then I remembered I haven't seen the movie Pleasantville. Interestingly enough, with Tobey Maguire, right. who is man. But I haven't seen that movie for the longest time. But there's only so many movies that convert from black and white to color. And so that kind of invoked that same thing of Pleasantville was, well, here's a, a social media image or, or a, a presented image of, you know, everything's a suburban pleasant life. But then behind that is a is a darker layer to unpeel or, or things aren't always as they seem. So the transition from black and white to color, uh, it's a callback or a similarity to what what the movie Pleasantville had done. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, some of the the characters uh, here, and in particular, the no the notion of we've got two characters, right? You've got Scarlet Witch and Vision, who are arguably some of the strongest Avengers in the MCU, but they are playing these bumbling kind of you know, dimwit sitcom characters. Uh, so I think that is interesting. And I wonder if there is something there. Like if we think of this as you know, somebody is doing this to Wanda and it specifically says to Wanda, it's not you know, to vision, right? It, it's specific, the, the voice, uh, the, the FBI agent's voice is speaking directly to Wanda. Because I was thinking, could this be something that Wanda has constructed for herself? Is this something where this is sort of a dream state that she may have created for herself? Because she's she's gone through such trauma, right? She's seen her parents get killed. She's seen, uh, uh, she suffered in Sokovia as a kid. She's gone through Bar uh, Dr. Uh, Baron Strucker's uh, experiments with uh, Loki Scepter. Uh, she's seen her brother die she's been the bad guy she's killed vision and she's seen vision die and then she got dusted and then she comes back so she's gone through serious you know obviously serious emotional trauma so could this have been a construct that she created for herself i don't think so because uh, for for one of two reasons one is the obvious the fbi agent is talking to you who's doing this to you so that's probably a wink that this is not a construct that she's developed for herself. But also, she's from Eastern Europe. The character is from Sokovia, so, or at least in, in the MCU world. What's the chances that she was watching 50s, 60s television, American television in Eastern Europe? Not likely. I mean, maybe as propaganda, look at this, you know, American decadence or, or something like that. But 
I don't think this is going to be something that she would have been watching as a kid. So between those two elements, I don't think that this is something that she's constructed for herself. It's somebody has put it upon her. What's your take on that, Mr. C? Interesting take. If only we had the magic eight ball to to spin and flip over and, and see what the magic eight ball would, would say on this. Now, right. so in the, and again, we know that there, again, there are blended elements. The MCU takes basic things from the comics and reinterprets, adds new things in. And so you have a different reality that doesn't correspond directly one to one to what's been on the comic book page. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the comics, it's more so the case that uh, the Scarlet Witch, as she was working through her trauma, and so now here's a grounded element, people that encounter trauma, even in, a, in a, uh, an element of reality to go with the, the fantasy and sci-fi genre. Uh, you know, so it, did she, didn't she? I think that's, that's, the suspense question that's coming to be resolved. So in other words, either it will match the comics continuity and this will be all a construct of her mind that was then brought to a reality through the use of her reality warping powers of historically known as her hex powers. Uh, or it'll have been some kind of outside influence. So let's, uh, why don't we uh, shift over to the commercials? So to talk about the, the commercials, I think those are really interesting, probably nods to the past life of Wanda and whether those are now seeping in. And you know, because you've got, so we've got two episodes, we've got two commercials. The first one is this very strange Stark toaster oven or toaster. And, and then the second one is the Strucker watch. So within the Stark commercial, it's 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 kind of unsettling. You're it's it, you feel uncomfortable watching it. You're staring at the toaster. It's the first time I think in that episode where we get the splash of color in episode uh, one, where the light is flashing red, and uh, the tagline is I wrote it down. Forget the past. This is your future. So I think what's going on in that is, as you're staring at the toaster, it's recalling one of the very first stories that Wanda shares where she watches her parents get killed. And then there's a bomb that falls in front of her and her brother. And it doesn't go off. But it, the one word that they can see on it is Stark. So I think it is a flashback to her first story to us or her oldest story to us of being trapped, being uh, a, 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 a victim of Stark's uh, arsenal of weapons, the Stark, uh, Stark Industries arsenal of weapons, and waiting for you know, the, the bomb to explode. I think that's that memory. And then with the Strucker watch, we've got, I think, we, you know, Strucker has time for you, or something along those lines. I think that's recalling to Pietro and Wanda connecting with Strucker, willingly volunteering to participate in these experiments so that they can take revenge on Stark and the Avengers. Um, so I think these are glimpses or, uh, of her past that are being kind of forced into her memories in the form of, of commercials. I think that's what's going on. Um, my read on the toaster was that well, so there's two red indicators, and again, so now there's color amongst the black and white. But were they right. eyes? Was the was the toaster now or or later going to show? Was it some mind numbing or mind control device that's being used on Wanda? That's entirely possible. It's a mm -hmm. it's not a red herring. It's at least it's it's a candidate for uh, one of the elements that they're using. Uh, I was wondering, in a Transformers-like way, the two red eyes reminded me of Ultron. Was this thing about to do a, a, a Transformers uh, flip around and then that would be a toaster if it was going to pop up as an evil robot instead of a toaster? So, yeah, right. I'll be very curious for both the toaster and the uh, watch uh, how those things pay off uh, in the future episodes. Yep, yep. Um, 
Talk about uh, color. Do you have? Did you have any thoughts about the color flashes and then the return of color at the episode, ep- episode two? Any impressions about the color beats? So yeah, uh, apart from the the general <clears throat> similarity to to the movie Pleasantville, the fact that earlier in episode two, again the setup, this this uh, fundraiser is for the children. And at the first, the so even Wanda, when she's amongst the group of the other ladies of the, if it was the auxiliary club or the rotary club, when she's amongst the other ladies, then they all stated in sync, the children. And she wasn't in sync with them. She said, there's just those two simple words, the children after them later on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're planning that as a little seed that there's something desynchronous or she's out of sync with the rest of everybody else that's around her and then later in the episode when they do the callback and they're starting to convert into full color from black and white uh that all of a sudden she's slightly pregnant so again in the comics there was the uh idea that she having wanted to have children but they weren't uh, conceived through a conventional means that they were magically induced uh, magically created children so it, there's definitely something starting to turn there. And again, that's completely got my curiosity as well. So you've got the, all these things will clearly come together, but it, I, I really like all these miniature or, or all the, the compilation of all the different elements that are, that are uh, setting up now for the payoff later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just a, a couple of other things, uh, just to drift back uh, about color. So you see the color flash in the toaster. You see the color in the blood on Dottie's hand. And what an evil character uh, <laughs> uh, from that, uh, from what we see of her in episode two. Um, you see the uh, uh, the helicopter we already talked about, and then uh, obviously transforms into color at the end. So I feel like it's it's a bit of a glimpse into you know whatever construct, whatever world Wanda is being likely forced into here that uh that it's like it's trying to chip away at it uh i don't think that uh, i i i don't think we're going to go back to black and white uh in the remainder of the series or i don't i don't expect that to happen uh because we're moving forward in time it seems uh with yakety yak as the song so that puts it in 1959 and with help me Rhonda, i think that's 1964 or 1965 I don't actually know that for sure. I, I looked it up and I just forgot which year it was. So I, I'm not like a like a, an expert on uh, Beach Boys uh, uh, music, uh, but yeah. So we're somewhere in the '60s. I assume we're going to move to Brady Bunchy kind of era or something. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, or at some point. So what do you think about? Uh, we've seen other characters that uh, we haven't talked about yet. Uh, the Catherine Hahn Agnes character, uh, Dottie, we briefly talked about, and, and Geraldine. Um, what do you think they are doing? Are they part of this construct? Are they conspirators putting uh, Wanda into the spot? Or what do you think is going on with those three characters? In, in Matrix terms, are they... Uh... The agent, I can't even think, I was going to say Mr. Anderson, but that's not the, so the agent who keeps saying Mr. Anderson, whatever his character's name is, are they, are they the equivalent of that guy or are they something different? Uh, Good question. And again, as I referenced the Magic 8 Ball, it'd be great to have the Magic 8 Ball on this one. For Agnes, I almost know more about her from the trailer than from having watched her in episodes one and and two. Uh, Mm -hmm. So again, a very in terms of bewitched, she's not quite a Gladys Kravitz, but she is a the, the, either the next door neighbor or the immediately close by neighbor. But then, so here again, the setup at the sitcom level early on, but from the trailer, we know there's something ominous or or spooky when we get to the Halloween part of the story, mm-hmm. and so again, how exactly what will they use to bridge from here to there i'm i'm curious to see so i can't say i know that much but of the other characters again it'll i'm curious of the bridges Dottie seems pretty uh 
again, sitcom level could just be the evil neighbor, but a uh, sitcom evil neighbor is, you know, just played for laughs. Uh, foil might be a better descriptor of the character. Uh, but yeah, it, who knows? Maybe she's going to come out to be something really significant in terms of powers or in terms of the plot points later on. And, and Geraldine, it's just total mystery to me. But what's your what's your read on any or all of those three characters? Yeah, no, I think with I, I think with uh, Geraldine, uh, who, who's great uh, in episode two. We don't see her in episode one. Uh, yeah. I don't think we do, um, the, but uh, with that character, I I don't think she's part of the the construct. I, I, I suspect that she's actually a, one of the victims of whatever's happening here, because when she asks, when Wanda asks, "What's what's your name?" Um, she she has to like take a beat and think, and then it's Geraldine. So I think she, and, and then uh, and there, there's a a moment in the trailer where uh, she doesn't know who she is, uh, actually. You know, between that episode and the trailer, I don't think she's a conspirator or uh, of this uh, of this uh, dream state. I think she's actually one of the victims. As for Agnes, I have a feeling she may end up being the big bad, right? That's the kind of turn that uh, can happen where somebody who you think is the, the colleague or the friend or the, the ally, and then there's a betrayal, you know, she's helping Wanda navigate this odd world in both of those episodes. So I think uh, that Agnes, the, the neighbor character may end up being the, the big bad of, of some kind in this, in the show. Dottie, I don't think we know enough about, um, you know, it, it clearly, uh, She's kind of the, the bad guy and then becomes the friend by the end of the episode in episode two. Um, but that would be kind of down the middle that you know, somebody who's the, the bad neighbor ends up being the bad, the bad guy in the show. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think she may just be part of the part of the matrix uh, to use your analogy. So, I don't know. Uh, but Agnes, I got a feeling is maybe that the bad, uh, the villain of the show. What do you think, uh, anything else that we should talk about before we get to what do we think is actually going on? What what else have we missed here? Well, what I'll else say, we talk about? again, from the sitcom-like presence of, uh, or the sitcom-like influence of, hey, Vision, here's a stick of gum. A right. very sitcom, like, oh, he, a character is going to have a piece of gum and that's going to lead to a hijinks. Uh, the graphic then that they, they showed... The, the gum literally gumming up his works. It's fabulous. So on one hand, how ridiculous. Here's this super powered android or synthesoid, artificial creature, whichever way you want to refer to him, defeated by a stick of gum. That's, <laughs> on one hand, that's completely far-fetched. It's completely hilarious. But then also the stylized way that they presented that through the the, the cartoon image within the within the show that that was really good. So I really liked the stick of gum bit and then how they utilized that in their magic act uh, leading to the sitcom hijinks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there, there's a, uh, a signal also in the kind of sitcom tropes that were chosen for episode one and episode two. For episode one, yeah, it's about forgetting, right? And trying to fit in to this this world that they are in they've forgotten what's the significance of the the heart on the calendar they've forgotten you know how long have they been married when were they married uh where are they from they don't remember and they don't know any of this uh stuff so there's that but in terms of forgetting an important date you know that's kind of a or why or the and hijinks arise or something like that you know, that's that's a common kind of sitcom trope with the second episode, you've got additional layers that are in there, right? So it's the bewitched aspect, but then it's also about this magic show and the deception that uh, comes along with it and trying to show that there's no magic behind the magic. So it's like further compounding this, okay, I'm in a fantasy world, but then there's a fantasy world in the fantasy world, just piling it on. 
there's there I think there's some signaling and some some meaning in there uh, that's going on. The world within the world stuff definitely expressed in those ways that you just said, also expressed toward the end of episode one when they show in the credits, you know, starring Wanda Maximoff, starring right. Vision, and then the pullback on the screen from the black and white TV to this maybe more control panel of which the black and white TV was one component. Um, very, again, who, who's sitting at that control panel and, and what puppet master ways are they bringing into the story? Yeah. I'm totally looking forward to seeing it all come together. Right. Yes. Yes. No, definitely. And yes, as you acknowledge, that's the further validation when they do the pullback and you can see that there's a control panel panel uh, going on there, uh, recording what's uh, happening uh, or prompting what's happening. So let's get into what do you think is actually going on here? And this is this is where we're going to get proven wrong. We're going to watch this, rewatch our own episode of ourselves uh, eight eight weeks from now, and see how wrong were we? Yeah, let's go. Be ready to be really wrong, just in case. <laughs> As we know, it could be a storyline that will follow more closely to what had been shown in the comics. It could be a storyline that'll follow along more what they've established for the previous movies and previous MCU in general. Yeah, where it'll be a, a hybrid of, of comic and new element um i don't know what's yeah. my best guess. my best guess is that they're uh they're going to do a fake out and at, for whatever it seems to be like they're all, the set of clues the trail of crumbs will lead one way in a mystery like fashion or in a tv detective kind of a way and then there will be a, a zigzag where the the true uh after the red herring elements are dismissed then there'll be the true reveal of what's going on so the yeah. see, again, you know, it, to me, for right now, for what we know and what we don't know, the radio part, the radio transmission is key because either the radio transmission is a direct clue along that path or the radio transmission is a, is a fake out clue. So yeah. obviously there will be other clues in the upcoming episodes, but for me right now it, it hinges on that. Is that direct to the to the end game if you will or or is that the pre zigzag or the pre uh, before the adjustment comes before right. the true right. will come yeah yeah I, I i wonder um you know just with that voice is the fbi agent now an agent of sword right uh is is that is it sword trying to reach out to wanda that perhaps she's been captured, uh, perhaps she's been forced into some type of situation. I was, I'm not sure when in time we are. Like, is are we uh, right after Endgame, or is it substantially after Endgame? I, I, I don't know what what time we are in uh, when this is all happening. Um, I do think that she has uh, been forced into this situation. Uh, I was also then spinning a thought of, you know, could it be that? Wanda has become overpowered and created a fantasy land for everybody, right? Could she have, you know, realized her powers where she's now been able to change reality for the world or Earth? Um, but I, I don't think that's what's happening. I think something it's something has happened to her specifically. Um, do you think Vision is still dead? Oh boy. Um, I'll go with, he's still dead and I'll go with, this is a construct of her mind for now. Although I, you know, I, I could be entirely wrong, but as I was just speaking of the radio being a, a key, uh, a key reveal, then there's right. also all the unknowns of what will come to pass in back on the movie side, the Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness. So we know, we know she's somehow connected to the movie and to the plot of the movie. So we know the idea of madness and the idea of a multiverse or things being mad, switching from one reality to the next reality, or, or you know, what are the lines that separate the one reality and the next? So again, there's a whole lot of Twilight Zone stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so if I'm committing off the limited information for right now, then I'll say it is all a construct of her mind. And mm -hmm. as 
you referenced earlier as, as a function of her processing those multiple significant traumas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's right. Uh, I, I do think that uh, vision is re regrettably uh, dead and, and the, there he is on the screen. Um, you know, the, the death of, of vision is traumatic and awful. The, you know, Thanos just savagely rips out the stone and you can see the crack, the shell in his, uh, in his, uh, in his, uh, skull, uh, or the synthesoid skull. Um, I, I think he is regrettably dead and it's, it's almost tragic in that Wanda rewinds back, right? In episode two, she asks, uh, vision is this real? Is this really happening? And, and vision has a kind of a sad look and says, yes, yes, Wanda, it's, it's real. Uh, I don't think it's real. I don't think that vision is alive, that this is potentially a construct to help uh, Wanda cope with uh, loss and uh, trauma. And uh, yeah, but somebody may be doing this to her to lead to something else, to perhaps you turn uh, Wanda Maximoff into the Scarlet Witch and, or, or potentially a villain in uh, the Doctor Strange 2 uh, Multiverse of Madness. I think that's where it could be leading. So which villains are the candidates for that? So I know the, the Marvel character Nightmare is a traditional Doctor Strange villain or rival for Doctor Strange. So it's entirely possible that Nightmare, who's in this dream realm or nightmare realm that draws psychic power or energy off of people having nightmares. So that's a possibility. Did okay. Ultron reconstruct itself in some kind of a way and is ultron the, the puppet master behind i mean so or other other unidentified unknown villain uh is it this beekeeper the person in the beekeeper suit you know it's just there's a i i look forward to the uh the next installments to to put the clues together yeah, I was reading a little bit too much into Age of Ultron. I watched a little bit of it, not not the whole thing last night, obviously because I'd like to sleep. But uh, the with uh, Ultron character, he talks to to Wanda and tries to suggest that you know I, I want you to destroy the Avengers from the inside. And you know Wanda takes the turn, right? She becomes the hero. She she the light the switches on for her with Hawkeye, you know, coming out of the building and, and fighting for her country and fighting with the Avengers. Uh, but she starts, you know, again, she starts as the villain and Ultron's direction is to turn her, is to destroy the Avengers from the inside. And that kind of is what happens, right? It's the, with Civil War uh, in the battle uh, that, that happens, you know, she, she gets that, uh, the fire of crossbones uh, blowing up throws it up into the building. And that's what leads to the Sokovia course that ends up creating division within the uh, Avengers. And perhaps that division, I mean, there was probably a one in 16 million set of scenarios that were that was going to save the world. But, you know, you had the divided event of Avengers uh, at that time. So could it be yet again, the seeds of Ultron planted from way back when rearing its head and and Wanda Maximoff. I don't know, but nice breakdown. Like so, Ultron's plan didn't come to fruition the way he anticipated. But I didn't. That's a great read that you had on it right there. So even though it wasn't according to script, but then mm -hmm. the plot still went the same way. That there was some some internal maybe Zemo, the character Zemo from the Civil War movie, then borrowed Ultron's notes a little bit and and figured out that the best way to attack this team or this group is to capitalize on or generate their internal conflict. So mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, we've talked a lot here. Uh, any last things that we've uh, that you'd like to share or things that we've missed? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm along for the ride for this show. Again, similar to Disney Plus having the 
Mandalorian show drop on Fridays. It gives you something. It gives me something to look forward to for Friday night entertainment. Again, on the one hand, I appreciate the Netflix format where here's the whole series all at once. Sure. Uh, but but having the slow burn or the stay with the plot reveals over time, there's definitely a, uh, an enjoyment in that type of process of watching a show also. So uh, I'm, I'm good and I, I look forward to to the next show. Yeah, same, same. Uh, as, as, I, uh, I, as I said at the beginning, I have kind of mixed feelings. It feels a little slow to me. I understand where it will likely go. Um, I'm hoping it picks up the pace and that we start to get more reveals in episode three about what may be really happening. I think, you know, I, I think we have nine episodes for this series and we don't know for sure if there's going to be a season two. I will point out that on the, on the screen for Disney plus it, it does show that it's season one, which may it may just be that they, it may just be that it's a drop down. They they need to put a number well, next you to it. Can't call it but, zero. You can't, yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. So so it may mean nothing that it just says season one. Um, so anyways, I think I think there's nine episodes in the season, and I'm expecting that maybe this is like the first act of three acts, and and we'll start to see more. I am going to continue watching, obviously. It's not like I got anything else to watch right now <laughs> while we're in quarantine or uh, while the pandemic still uh, rages outside. But you know, as an MCU fan, I'm, I'm obviously uh, uh, interested and engaged in this stuff. So uh, looking forward to the next episodes. Uh, with that, I just want to say uh, thanks for the folks that have been watching. And as we said at the very beginning, you know, Post in the comments your feelings and impressions about WandaVision and episodes one and two. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Where do you think this is going? How do you feel about the series thus far? Um, I'm also curious, though, if you're a younger watcher of the Fanboy Cantina, you know, with these examples that they've got of the TV sitcoms in episodes one and two, did that land for you at all? Or was this sort of like, what the heck is this? This is my... This is my dad's or granddad's uh, or grandparents' uh, my gr uh, my parents or grandparents' uh, uh, TV. You know, I, I don't even it doesn't even jive for me. Um, so uh, I, I'm interested in how it lands for other other viewers. Um, anything else that you want to ask for our our audience, Mister C? Just any comments or thoughts they have, observations, comparisons to the comics comparisons to the previous MCU releases, speculative comparison to, to what's coming in the, uh, the Falcon and, and winter soldier. I was, I almost said Falcon and the snowman. But <laughs> right. uh, and, and what's the other MCU show that's coming to TV? What if? Uh, yeah. So there, so there, there's, there's any, <laughs> Say anything you want in the comment section, and if it's with any one of those uh, other ties, then then great. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, thanks as always, Mr. C. Always a joy to have you on the Fanboy Cantina, and uh, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, do us a favor, hit the like if you like this video, and if you haven't subscribed yet, uh, what are you doing? please hit the subscribe button. And, and thanks everybody who have joined the Fanboy Cantina. It's been great to see the growth and subscribers. It means a lot to uh, Mr. C and I. So thanks for watching. Please take a moment to like, share, and subscribe. This has been the Fanboy Cantina.